Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet more Warhammer 40k lore, where today we are going to be talking about the Uvath, an extremely secretive and mysterious Xeno species that, despite being thought long since extinct, still continue to plague the Imperium to this very day. The Uvath were an ancient species located in the northern edges of the galaxy. Or possibly, they were a fledgling species located outside of our own galaxy. They relied upon warp technology to fuel their weapons, or possibly, they were little more than warp ghosts inhabiting crudely formed machinery. They were wiped out by the Angevin Crusade, or possibly we have seen no more than a mere outpost of their vast intergalactic empire. Confused yet? <laughs> I don't blame you, because the truth is, the only thing the Imperium knows for sure about the Uvath is that it doesn't know a whole lot about the Uvath at all in large part due to the zealous efforts of the God Emperor's Most Holy Inquisition, who in their infinite wisdom deemed that the Imperium did not need to know anything about this perfidious alien species. And this would, of course, be far from the first time the Inquisition organizes a good old-fashioned book burning with a side of alien barbecue, after finishing up the genocide of an entire Xeno species, and on many occasions, the information so vigorously purged by the Emperor's most well-meaning of servants would probably have served the Imperium far better in a less ashen state. But... There is a reason why the Inquisition is so very touchy around certain genres of literature. They don't burn this information just because the heat feels pleasant to their cold, dead souls, but because in the 41st millennium, information absolutely can be dangerous. Merely reading a line of text in certain forbidden tomes genuinely can drive people into madness and demon worship. And considering the picture painted from the pieces that we can gather together from the Uvath's history, it seems that on this particular occasion, the Inquisition were well within their rights to bust out the flamethrowers. For the most dangerous of all knowledge is that pertaining to the Immaterium the warp, and the Uvath, they fueled their entire civilization on warp energies. If ever there was a Xeno species out there that truly deserved the full heavy flamer treatment, it was the Uvath. Their entire society was steeped in the utilization of warp power, they used it for their weapons, for their guardians, for their transportation, even for the little robots who maintained their cities. Everything ran off the power of the great immaterial ocean. And the power of the warp, almost without exception, always corrupts. Although, in the case of the Uvath, there may be indications that they were one of very few exceptions. Not that that would matter to the Imperium, of course, because they are not an exception. And therefore, knowledge of a race like the Uvath, who utilize the warp like we may use electricity, that is extraordinarily dangerous information. Someone might be silly enough to try and replicate it. There are even factions within the Adeptus Mechanicus who consider the Uvath's usage of technology as not a problem, but indeed a solution. For if the powers of the warp can be harnessed in a quote unquote safe manner, then that surely would solve a great deal of quandaries, would it not? But to be clear, the vast majority of the Mechanicus, the very people who have to be physically restrained and prevented from feeling up every Necron tomb world within reach with their wriggly mechanical tentacles, 
even they find Uvas technology to be a little bit too risky. And when the Magos, who's using a gorse flare as a penis enhancement, shies away from something, it's probably best to keep a very, very safe distance. But what is it about Uvas technology that is so bad? Well, two things primarily. First and foremost, Uvath technology utilizes the warp not merely to power it, but also as a part of its construction. It literally opens a hole into the warp, and through this gap allows the energy to flow, and then the technology harnesses it, creating visible tendrils of dark energy capable of holding together vast slab-like constructs. The Uvath would construct entire spaceships in this matter, having large gaping holes into the immaterium through which the energies would flow, be converted into these dark tendrils, and then they would use them almost like ropes or chains to bind together the material parts of their vessels. This is a level of mastery over the warp that even the ancient Eldar before the fall would find difficult to replicate. And even if they would, they probably wouldn't. Even the Eldar at the height of their ignorance and hubris wouldn't be quite this callous with the warp. Just think of it. An active, stable warp portal at the heart of every Uvath vessel. One wrong calibration, one incorrect incantation, or a wrongly carved word on a prayer sheet or some control surface, and not just the entire ship, but a few hundred kilometers surrounding it, might be torn out of reality and plopped directly into the immaterium, where the souls of the crew, presuming they have any, will be at the tender loving mercy of uncountable hordes of hentai rape monsters. And that would still be the best case scenario. If the ship was to explode instead of implode, ripping a hole in reality, every populated planet within light years might suddenly find themselves with a brand new immigrant population of bloodthirsty demons. The fact that the Uvath have been able to establish any kind of a civilization whilst relying on technology this unstable and this ungodly dangerous speaks either to an incredible level of mastery over it or truly transcendent luck. I mean, for God's sake, the Uvath have literally created Roombas that run off warp energy. The so-called Shard Spiders, twelve-legged constructs round about the size of a large dog that were presumably created as a maintenance constructs for their cities and homes. It would be like installing a miniature Chernobyl power plant in your house for the sole purpose of cleaning the carpets. It's almost like these abhorrent little aliens simply decided to poke the demon bear to see what they could get away with, and before they knew it, they were balls deep in monster grizzly ass, and the only way to survive was to cling on yet tighter. And the tighter part in this case is that they not only decided to open up stable warp portals in everyday life, they also decided to create computers with a little bit of a twist to them. Whereas the holy machines of the Adeptus Mechanicus are all possessed of a machine spirit, an entity that can either be immeasurably helpful or as cantankerously destructive as an old man with a brand new and somewhat fragile glass butt plug, the Uvath decided to take this one step further and install their machinery with literal demons. The 40k equivalent of a Windows Vista boot disk, although slightly more reciprocal I suppose. And both of these things are, of course, immeasurably dangerous. The first, for obvious reasons, it's basically like installing ginormous bombs capable of not only just killing you, but also violating you in the process. And in the case of... just think of it for a second here. You have a computer, and you decide that, you know what, 
I'd like an artificial intelligence to help me out with some of the day-to-day -day chores, you know? I want it to be able to calculate numbers or, you know, give me recipes for waffles, right? I could program something extraordinarily complex and intelligent, technologically speaking, or I could infest my computer with Satan. <laughs> and the you both chose the second option. <laughs> Goodness gracious, and and this shit runs most of their civilization. See, here are some of the interesting things. Despite all of this, there exists very little clear indication that the Uvath were truly corrupted by chaos. And by corrupted, I mean affected by one or more of the four primary chaos deities or one of the lesser chaos gods. They seem to have been in control of the warp rather than the other way around, which is by far the more usual outcome. How they have managed this is almost impossible to comprehend, although it is... My personal theory is that they perhaps bred very selectively, or they biologically engineered themselves to a great degree to allow them to fit into this new society that they were creating. I base this upon the fact that evidence of Yuvarth physiology, how they looked, or their even basic biology, in the handful of reports that still survive outside of the Inquisition's knowledge, are all wildly divergent, as if they were all dissecting different specimens of different species. That suggests to me a great deal of customization, shall we say, on an individual level. Additionally, we also know that the Yuvath were slavers, um, with often a single Yuvath individual ruling over entire planetary populations, with the whole of the populace essentially being reduced to little more than servants for the single Yuvath individual. If they were really that few true Yuvath, then perhaps that again suggests that they were breeding, or indeed maybe building, constructing, biologically or mechanically speaking, one another on an extraordinarily selective basis. They only allowed those with the capabilities of resisting the warp's taint to actually become adult members of their society. Bearing in mind that this is, of course, good old-fashioned speculation. There is very little, if indeed any, direct evidence as to the societal structure of the Yuvath, or any kind of internal hierarchy beyond the fact that some Yuvaths had merely hundreds of thousands of slaves and others had millions. But, at the end of the day, whether the Yuvath really did possess a resistance to the warp or were simply extraordinarily lucky or perhaps were warp entities themselves, that is the less important question when it comes to the destruction of Yuvath technology and the information pertaining to them. Because even if the Yuvath were resistance, the Imperium isn't. And so when humanity encountered the Yuvath and learned of their capabilities, there was really only one solution. Exterminatus. As to precisely when the Imperium first encountered the Yuvath, this too is a little unclear. Yuvath civilization itself is very unclear as to when and where it existed. Some of their ruins are dated to have been around for a hundred thousand years, and yet if that was true, we would have known of them already. I doubt the Elder would have got along overly well with a species like the Yuvath. They would almost certainly have been at war with them, or at the very least there'd be some mention. And if they had been around when the Great Crusade moved into their sector, I very much so doubt that the Nascent Imperium would have taken particularly kindly to such a Xenos race. And we do know that the Great Crusades entered into what is now known as the Calix Sector. In fact, we have records of at least two rogue trader houses operating with solid human-populated homeworld bases within the Calix Sector, and using these bases as a springboard for further exploration into the northern fringes of the galaxy. 
If the Yuvarth have truly been around for a hundred thousand years, they almost undoubtedly bumped into the Great Crusade at one point or another. But seeing as this was in the extreme fringes of the galaxy, it is entirely possible that the heresy kicked off at around about the same time, leaving the Yuvarth, as dangerous as they definitely would be, as a relatively minor concern in comparison with everything else that was hitting the fan at oh such a considerable velocity. But over the millennia, Imperial control over the Calyx Sector began to wane. As for the precise reason, it is not entirely clear. In all due likelihood, it was a wide variety of different reasons, the Uvath almost certainly being one of them. Various minor Xeno species pushing into the fringes of Imperial space, along with a fairly considerable group of Orcs as well, saw Imperial control of the area of space lessen year by year. Until finally, at some point in the 4th century of the 39th millennium, the High Lords of Terra decided to reconquer the northern fringes of the Imperium by dispatching the Angevin Crusade, a massive military expedition made up of no less than 17 million Imperial Guard soldiers and forces from several Adeptus Asati's chapters. To begin with, the primary military objective of the Angevin Crusade was not the destruction of the Uvath and their servile Xenos races. Instead, it was simply a massed military expedition to stretch the borders of the Imperium out further, and to secure the more vulnerable heartlands with a nice big fat northern buffer zone. Indeed, it is even unclear if the Imperium was entirely cognizant of the Uvath and their capabilities before launching the attack. But considering the catastrophic first few encounters with the Uvath's warships, we may assume that if the Imperium had any understanding or knowledge of the Uvath, it certainly was not a deep understanding. The Uvath warships were able to make an absolute mockery of even the most heavily armoured Imperial vessels. Even battleships could be reduced to spinning hulks in but a single hit of the massive warp energy weaponry of the Uvath's capital ships. However, the Uvaths did not have anywhere near enough of these vessels, and soon the Imperium was able to outmaneuver and outlast the Xeno's Empire. It should also be mentioned that the vast majority of the Uvath fleets were not made up of these dark energy construct warships, instead being primarily made up of the ships of the various subject species, ships that did not possess anywhere near the destructive potential of their master's own vessels. Nevertheless, the Uvath and their seemingly inexhaustible slave armies quickly became the primary opposing force to the Angevin Crusade. Many of the smaller independent Xeno's empires were not ready for a war of this scale, and were swiftly swept aside by the advancing Imperial forces during the operation known as the Reaping of the Emperor's Wrath. The triumphant advance of the operation would place a full 200 populated worlds under the command of the Imperium. And soon, the Uvath and their slave species were the only remaining credible opposition left. They were meant to be swept away by another supporting formation heading out from Segmentum Obscurus under High Admiral Varkan. However, this force was decimated by massive warp storms. That may have been a natural occurrence, or it could have been interference directly from the Uvath themselves. Regardless of whether or not it was a hostile action or merely a natural disaster, the result was much the same. The scattering and near obliteration of the reinforcing forces both in the form of Imperial Guard regiments and Imperial Navy warships. This coinciding with the intervention of a large force of Orcs and other Xenos raiders put a bit of a stopper to the Angevin Crusade for many, many more years. 
and to pile yet further misery on top of the pile, several of the leading commanders of the Crusade forces were assassinated by unknown forces, possibly even Imperial servants, as the Crusade was undergoing a little bit of a crisis of leadership. Originally, the Crusade was led by Lord Militant Golgina Angevin, after whom the Crusade had been named, but he was starting to become somewhat... paranoid. He was of the opinion that some of his generals were winning a little bit too much in the way of easy victories, and he feared that their egos may be sufficiently bolstered for them to form the opinion that maybe, just maybe, they were wasted in their current positions, and that higher office might be more suitable to their clear tactical and strategic genius. And as it so happens, in this particular case, even if you are paranoid, that doesn't mean that they're not out to get you, as several of the generals did indeed start to have a little bit um, of an inflated opinion of themselves. This, along with the Lord Militant's suspicion, formed fertile ground for the creation of various factions within Imperial High Command, all with their own favoured candidates to take over the leadership of the Crusade. This internal power struggle, along with several attempted and occasionally successful assassination attempts, along with the intervention of outside Xenos forces and the stiffening resistance of the Yuvarth remnants, led to the Crusade grinding to an almost complete halt. It would take several more years and the eventual death of Lord Militant Golgina Angevin before a new leader rose to prominence, one by the name of Drusus, who had earned himself quite the cult following within both the Sector and the Crusade forces after he had been supposedly killed during an assassination attempt and yet then miraculously gotten back up again. All alive and shit. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that'll make for good religious propaganda, all right. A more skeptical individual than myself might suggest that if one were aiming for the highest position within a crusade, making oneself a candidate for living sainthood would not be a terribly bad idea if one had the backstory with which to back it up. Anywho, under the new and admittedly competent leadership of General Drusus, the Crusade once again got moving, stabilising its frontage, defeating the Orcs and Xenos raiders, and finally entering into the Uvarth's own areas of home space, where they began enacting the ultimate sanction of Exterminatus upon their planets, leading to the final complete scattering and presumed extermination of the Yuvath species. And those few remnants that remained had to deal with representatives of both the Ordo Malus and the Ordo Xenos. And for once, these two often competing branches of the God Emperor's Most Holy Inquisition were in complete and total agreement as to what was to be done with the remnants of the Yuvarth. And so, by all accounts, we have ourselves a happy ending, don't we? A successful Imperial Crusade that reconquered several hundred worlds and reintroduced several more to the beneficent rule of the God Emperor, along with the annihilation of several monstrous Xeno species, including the disgusting Yuvarth. Happy, happy. Oh, and by the way, Drusus eventually got his sainthood after a hundred years of deliberation by the High Lords and the Imperial Senate. Now, where some might say deliberation, I might say procrastination, since <laughs> the final death of the Lord General Militant occurred around about the same time when he was finally made into a saint. Hmm. Suddenly, he's no longer a threat to anyone, politically speaking, and voila! Sainthood! <laughs> Strange how that shit tends to work out. 
But for all the apparent and demonstrable successes of the Angevin Crusade, it was not a complete success. Whilst the Uvath appear to have been completely wiped out, appearances can be deceiving, and pieces of Uvath technology are still discovered with frightening frequency within the Kali sector, by those scrupulous enough to attempt to make a profit from their discovery. And make no mistake, if you can manage to correctly harness the power of a Uvath artifact, you can make yourself monstrously rich. Although you might be losing your soul in the process, but, you know. Whatever good did that pesky little soul do for you, eh? A mountain of cold hard cash is ever so more practical, wouldn't you say? I mean, <laughs> come on. It's not like your soul is immortal or anything. <laughs> not in the 41st millennium, anyways. Unless you piss off the uh, wrong deities, of course. <clears throat> In which case, it might very well be, but uh, not to your benefit, I think you will find. There are also suggestions that maybe, just maybe, in the more uh, fringe and darker corners of the sector, that minor bulwarks of Uvath domain still remain. And hell, if I was one of the Uvath at this point, I probably would be keeping my amorphous, blobbish, difficult to identify a head quite low, and my tentacles to myself. But there are other threats too. Uvarth technology was built to last, and there are still remnants of it scattered throughout the Kallax sector that provide uh, plenty dangerous obstacles for those silly enough to wander into their reaches. One such example might be the Bone Warden, a most vile Xenos construct created from random body parts. It's always body parts with these things, isn't it? Held together by a spherical entity, presumably the control center, created from dark warp energy. This energy manifests in the form of both the controlling sphere and tendrils that bind the body parts together, creating the guardian entity. These are, however, relatively minor threats. A uh, problem to a local community, to be sure, but hardly a planetary problem or a sector-wide problem. Now, for that, we have to look to the remnants of the Uvath's warships. Some of them, often referred to as Whisperers, are presumed to be capital-class vessels, a handful of which still remain within Imperial space, drifting through the void seemingly without any real direction, presumably because they have long since lost contact with Uvath command, if any such command structure still remains. This is not all good news, however, because it means that the Whisperer warships are still bound by their original directive, which just so happens to be to fight the Imperium, and they do so by corrupting Imperial planets. They are named Whisperers because when one gets within range of a world, it begins affecting the populace of the planet with dark dreams. Those afflicted by them tell of strange forms in the night, of disturbed rest, and of whispers, although they cannot quite make out what, if anything, the voices are saying, or even if they are speaking any kind of a recognizable language. But after being inflicted by these dreams for a period of time that can vary quite considerably, the victims are turned into de facto drones, as the Whisperer warship take over all of their higher functions and become able to puppeteer them, even going so far as to intrude upon their memories, allowing the drones to make use of all of their previous skills and crafts in life. Now, this is not to say that they are made undead, or even necessarily that they lose their sensibilities, they are merely reprogrammed, albeit not in a permanent fashion. If the Whisperer warship was to be destroyed, then all of the drones would return to normal. 
Or at least they would uh, return to the uh, appearance of normality. There are certainly many representatives of his most holy inquisition who would argue that one could never truly trust an individual that had been under the sway of such a pernicious entity, and that it would be better to simply just shoot them all. Safe rather than sorry, just in case they're merely pretending to be free of the alien influence. And the existence and activities of these warships also raises a further question. Are they truly just drifting through the void, undirected, unguided, carrying out some long-forgotten purpose? Possibly. They might not even be doing this on behalf of the Yuvarth any longer. After all, they did have a nasty habit of infecting their machinery with demonic entities. For all we know, they may have mutinied, essentially, and decided to take control of the vessel. If taking control is even the correct terminology to use here, and instead use it for its own means, spreading panic, destruction, and violence in their wake, so as to feed off the resultant turmoil. There is also the possibility that the Uvath are not quite as destroyed as we may think they are. There are even those who hypothesize that Uvath civilization as we know it may just be a tiny fraction of the total size of the Uvath Empire, perhaps located somewhere within the warp, or possibly even outside of the boundaries of our own galaxy. Certainly, that would explain why their empire seemed to be so relatively large in comparison to how few Yuvath there actually were. There are also again the suggestions that they have been around for hundreds of thousands of years as another explanation as to how so few Yuvath could control such a vast area of space. But these are also somewhat more fanciful explanations. If this was a sufficiently powerful race with the ability to enslave other minor races via technology like the Whisper ships, then I do not find it particularly difficult to believe that they might be able to spread very rapidly indeed and establish a de facto empire. After all, did we not see much the same thing when the ancient human federation was torn apart by the massive warp storms that blanketed the galaxy after the birth of Slanesh? Monstrously powerful psychers would rise to prominence on various worlds, enslaving entire planetary populations at a time. That seems a more reasonable explanation, at least to me, for the size of the Uvarth Empire. The idea that there is life outside of our galaxy is certainly not impossible, because, well, that's where the Tyranids came from, but that in and of itself is also a suggestion that maybe, just maybe, if there is life outside the galaxy, it's more of the teeth and cloy kind. And as for the suggestions that they might exist within the Immaterium, that too is far from impossible. Demon worlds exist within the depths of the Eye of Terror, essentially within the warp itself, and they are occupied by occasionally vast populaces of de facto slaves of the Dark Gods and their traitorous subjects. Whatever the truth may be, at least for now, the Imperium rest easy assured that the threat of the Yuvarth have been dealt with. Whether permanently or temporarily, that is up for the future to decide. Hopefully this video has been able to illuminate you a bit further on this most mysterious of alien species. And if you are interested in learning a bit more about the warp and chaos, since we've had multiple references to it here without really delving too deeply into it, I do have videos covering that subject as well. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and if you enjoy the video, please do consider sharing it around or interacting with it via the comments or the like-dislike button. And of course, as always, have a good day.